Hi, everyone. Thank you for being back on my show. I call Growth Factor. I have wonderful people like Rabbi Aaron on because I try to inspire our soul for many reasons, including helping us with mental and physical health. And that's why I have my show. I had anxiety for quite a while. And people like Rabbi have really helped with his message and everything that he does for students and adults and everyone around the globe. I want to tell you why he's here today. Well, first of all, he is a child of a Holocaust survivor, and he has struggled to erase his childhood image of God as a punishing old man in the clouds waiting for us all to fail. But the first thing I want to talk to Rabbi about is his mother passed about 14 years ago, and he has a story about her soul. So if you don't mind, Rabbi, if you can talk about that, and then later I'll ask a lot more questions and tell you more, much more about Rabbi. Thank you for being here, Rabbi. Okay. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, my mother, as you mentioned, was a Holocaust survivor. And um, I, I felt uh, I felt very, very close to my mother. At, at a very young age, I woke up to my mother screaming in the middle of the night, having a nightmare of the concentration camp. And I remember that night I was uh, bombarded with questions. Is there a God? And if there's a God, is he good? And if he's good, why is the why is the world so bad? And if we are supposed to be the chosen people, I wish he chose somebody else. And at a young age, I really, really very much struggled with God and suffering and tragedy. Um, my mother uh, got cancer. She struggled with it for about three years. And I was by her side when she was dying. Uh, she had lost consciousness. She was taking very, very deep breaths. And suddenly I realized that my mother wasn't dying, that she was actually giving birth. And uh, she, um, there was a moment she was taking these deep breaths, which were, kind of reminded me of uh, when I witnessed the birth of my own child and these deep, deep breaths. And then she kind of tightened her lips and she, as a soul, left her body. And that's what I experienced. I did not feel I saw death. I, I saw the, the parting of her as a soul leaving her body. And um, it was interesting. You have what's called the Hevra Kedisha, which is the, uh, who, who, who deal with the body and moving the body and preparing it for, for, for burial. And when the two fellows that came in that work for that organization came to pick up her body, one picked up her legs and the other one picked her up by her shoulders. And I expected to see her body sag like anybody would, but her body was straight like a board. And I said, okay, there's no question that my mother was not a body. We're not a body, we have a body. Uh, a lot of people think we have a soul, we have a body, but that's actually not so. We don't have a soul, we are a soul. Uh, that field of awareness that I am, you know, if someone says to you or asked you, who were you before you got the name, you know, your name, um, that's soul. Soul is that pure awareness, that I amness. And um, I'm not my body. Uh, I have a body. My body's like a car. I value my body. I honor my body. I take care of my body. And I can't get around in this world without my body. But I, when I'm no longer going to need to get around in this world because I'm going to another world, I leave my body. My father, he passed away nine months after my mother, or he gave birth to his soul nine months after my mother. And uh, I, I was with him. I wasn't by his side uh, at, at that parting moment, but I was by his side about two weeks before that. And my father said to me, he had suffered for many years. He had, uh, he had gone through dialysis for maybe five years and difficult ending. And um, my father one night was lying in bed and he said, you know, this body has no spare parts like a car. But honestly, in my head, I'm 17 years old. And he was. And I realized that my father never grew old. My mother never grew old. Souls don't age. When a person says how old you are, uh, it depends what you mean by that. 
my body is 65, but I'm a soul and my soul doesn't belong to time. My soul is beyond time. So, you know, there's a teaching of Rabbi Nachman of Bretzlov, the great Hasidic master, who said that you should never grow old. And how would a person not grow old? Well, when you're, because your body grow old, but let's say you bought a car that's uh, 50 years old. That makes you 50 years old. It's your car. And so uh, the more we identify with our bodies and think we are our bodies, the more we take on the aging and the sickness of our bodies, God forbid, but whatever our bodies suffer. But, but if I can step away from the body and inhabit the body, but not become the body, then I'm a soul. And I saw that my mother left her body and I believe my mother is alive and well with my father. And, uh, but not in, in my world of perception. Incredible. I can't believe you just were, used the word perception because I asked people who watch the show, what questions would you like to ask for Rabbi Aaron? And I got a question from BJ Goldman of Minneapolis. I'm going to read it to you, Rabbi. He's a fan. He said that you have a saying, what you believe is what you perceive and what you perceive is what you receive. And he wrote, or it's turned around. What you perceive is what you believe and what you believe is what you receive. I'd like to ask the rabbi to clarify which way is it because some people quote him differently. <laughs> it's nice to know people are quoting me. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, <clears throat> well, I, well, what I always say is what you believe uh, is what you receive. Now, the, I, I could go either way with which, you know, believe or perceive, but bottom line, you know, it's what you're telling yourself. Your ultimate choice in life is how you perceive what's, what's going on. Uh, if a person believes this is a dog eat dog world, if that's what you believe, then that's what you're going to perceive. And that is what you're going to receive because you've identified people as dogs. You, already are looking out for your tail that someone's going to take a bite out of it. And, uh, you know, I, one of my neighbors said that his professor said, if you just know that if you believe it's a rat race, that even if you win it, you're going to be a rat. And so we, we need to take responsibility of what we're saying to ourselves about what's happening. Uh, Cause what is is, but we never see objective reality as it is. We only see, objective reality as it's perceived by us. And so what we choose to believe is in, 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 is so fatal in terms of what we ultimately receive. There's actually a, a nice little TED talk that I once saw, and I'm not sure I'm getting all the details correctly, but it was something to the fact that they uh, saw that people who clean up hotels in their daily routine, it actually equals what a person would need to do for exercise. So they did an experiment and they told a group of cleaners of a hotel that the, 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 the work that you do actually equals what a person should do in exercise and it's actually good for your health. And then they told another group of people that, listen, you know, you really need to exercise and all the work that you do in the hotel doesn't add up at all and doesn't count towards exercise. And they wanted to see whether these two groups would have a different uh, impact. And it did. Those who believe that the work they're doing is actually also accomplishing exercise actually became healthier. And those that believe that what they're doing does not count as exercise, it didn't help them at all. And there's so many experiments that are demonstrating the incredible power of belief. In fact, I think there's nothing more important in our lives than to determine what it is that we believe. Is this what I want to believe? Did I ever choose to believe this? And is this the most empowering belief to be living with? Because our beliefs is the light we view the world with. And so what you believe is, you know, people say seeing is believing, but I don't think so. I think believing is seeing. You know, what you believe is ultimately what you're going to ultimately see. Oh, gosh, I just love what you're saying, because it transfers into my next question. And that is, you're talking about what you, you receive what you believe. So, <clears throat> you know, something happened at Mount Sinai, and people eventually called it Torah. And some people call it Bible. So I wanted to know, what is the de definition of Torah? I mean, you're talking, speaking to us from Israel, so you you know purely what is Torah and why did that happen? People were living their life and all of a sudden 
some entity decide to come down and tell people Torah. So I want to know what is the definition of Torah and, and why do you think this happened? So I do want to preface that, you know, there are some questions that get an answer and some questions get a class. And then there's some questions that get a course. You ask the course question, but <laughs> I don't want to leave you okay. hanging. So I'm going to give you an answer, but I'm going to apologize because it's far from a complete uh, and fair answer that you certainly deserve, and so do all the listeners and uh, you know today. But the word Torah uh, literally comes from the word lahorot, which means to teach. And Torah are, is 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 a book of teachings. Uh, however, the word Torah is also associated with the Hebrew word, which means to catapult or to shoot. Uh, and so really the Torah is about uh, launching us forward in our lives. So it's not just simply a teaching for information, but it's actually a teaching for transformation. And it's meant to launch us into new orbits of consciousness. Uh, technically though, uh, that's conceptually, but technically uh, the Jewish people claim a, a, a tradition that our entire nation, thousands and thousands of people, witnessed an encounter with the Creator. Now, whether a person believes that or not, it is quite extraordinary that no nation has ever even made that claim. So if you can make up a claim like that, you'd think a lot more, at least one more nation or religion would make that claim, but you can't make up claims like that. And yet the Jewish people, uh, have a claim that there was an encounter at Sinai where the creator uh, in, in encountered and communicated to us, the creatures. Uh, the Christians believe that event happened. The Muslims believe that uh, event happened. Uh, and then there's different interpretations of what is the implications of that as time went on. But I'm not going to go there right now. But uh, the Torah is the revealed will of the creator. You might say, it's the owner's manual and literally the owner, it depends on who the owner is, but the great owner uh, is manual to living uh, a best, our best life. You know, I tell my students that I don't teach Torah because I think it's true. Although I do think it's true, but that's not why I've embraced this career to be a teacher. I think math is true. I don't teach math. And so I don't teach Torah because I think it's true. I teach Torah because it's changed my life and has given me a great life. And so I, sh I teach Torah as an act of kindness that if you've got something that really works, share it with others. And there's no question in my life and the life of my family that the teachings and the guidance and the lifestyle of Torah has given us an extraordinarily wonderful life. And Rabbi, did you say the definition of Torah? Does it mean instructions? It can, but coming from the word Lahorot, which means to teach. to teach. Or I use the idea of an owner's manual. So it is a guide. You know, you could call it God's guide to the good life. Okay. I, I have a question. I'm going to ask it, but then I'm going to pause, tell people more about you who might be meeting you for the first time. And I'm going to do a screen share of your books and your website. So if you can guide us through that. So my question is going to be, because I was asked by people who watch my show, is there a hell, a Satan? Am I going to hell? So, but I'm going to pause real quick. I want to tell you more about this rabbi because how I met him, he's not going to remember because he has people all over the world that reach out to him. And he has so many incredible stories, including meeting a lot of in, in, powerful influencers in Los Angeles that he, he himself has influenced. So I was just so inspired by rabbi because he's funny, he's inspiring, and just he speaks all around the world. So if you want to reach out to him to come speak to your school or share about his school or just, just come speak. I mean, he oh, he's so inspiring and, and so entertaining, but I wanna tell you more about him. So Rabbi Aaron received his rabbinic ordina ordination for Yeshivat ITRI. He is the Dean and founder of Israel Light. He runs more educational programs in Israel and abroad, including rabbinic enrichment, leadership training, executive seminars, retreats, outreach seminars, and more. He's also developed educational curriculum for Jewish high schools and he's the author of eight paradigm shifting books. Ask a little bit okay. about your eight books. What are the most popular? And I'm so bummed that it didn't work. But uh, to tell you which one's most popular is like telling you which one of my children is most popular. <laughs> okay. I can't All do right. that. All right. uh, although one of them is no, I'm just joking. But um, 
So uh, I, I wrote a book called Endless Light, uh, The Ancient Path of Kabbalah to Love, Spiritual Growth, and Personal Power. And it really is just about that, uh, The Ancient Secrets to Love, Growth, and Personal Power. I wrote another book called uh, Seeing God, 10 Life-Changing Lessons from the Kabbalah, which is literally how we can see God, but not with our physical eyes, but with our eyes of soul and how one actually opens the eyes of their soul. So it's a very experiential guide. Uh, I, I wrote another book called uh, The uh, God-Powered Life, which is kind of like the psychology of spirituality. Who are you as a soul and the secrets to empowerment? Uh, I wrote another book, which is one of my deepest books called The Secret Life of God, which is really dealing with the, um, the deep teachings of who are we, why are we, what we can become. And what is the nature of the relationship between the human and divine? And why is life so difficult? Uh, I wrote another book called Living a Joyous Life, which is really a guide to practical daily Jewish living. Uh, you know, why do we celebrate Shabbat? Why do we eat kosher? Why do we study Torah? What does it mean to live the commandments? I wrote another book on the holidays called Inviting God In, which is all about Jewish holidays. And I wrote another book called Love is My Religion, which takes the book of Genesis and it develops the conceptual theme of how the first mistake of Adam and Eve uh, is really the beginning of the transformation of the world towards a higher consciousness. Um, I hope I remembered all of them. Oh, no, I wrote a book on prayer called uh, Soul Powered Prayers. I think I got all of them, but I hope I hope I did. <laughs> I wasn't counting. And if people want to reach out to you, Rabbi, I was going to, I was going to pop up your website and your book. I can't believe it disappeared. I practiced this, but oh, well, how, is there an email, a website, people who want to. Right. So you, I have a website. Speak, speaking. I have a, I have a website, Rabbi David Aaron.com. Aaron is A-A-R-O-N. So Rabbi David Aaron.com. And through there, you can find me. Uh, I have a weekly uh, bite that I send out to anybody who's interested in receiving it. And I'm happy to be of help to anybody because what are we doing here on this planet anyways? It's an honor and a privilege to be useful and to be helpful. So if I could be of help, that, that would be uh, a, a great gift to me. Well, I receive your emails. Thank you. They're so fulfilling. Is there a quick way the people listening right now, I'll put it, like I said, in the description below, but a quick way to reach out to you to get the weekly emails? Go, go to the website. Just go to the website and sign up that way. Okay, let's go back to the question. And that is, you know, most people want to know, am I going to hell? Is there a hell? What's the Jewish concept versus other religions? Okay. So, again, these are all very deep questions and they deserve a lot more time. But um, we have to start off with realizing that the world we're in is a perception, not an illusion, but a perception. Uh, if you were to look at the table in front of you through a microscope, you wouldn't see the same table. And so the table as it appears to you is the way you're looking at it. If you change the way you look at the table, the table's going to look differently. So the world that we're in is a perception of an objective reality and how that objective reality is perceived subjectively by us, depending on who we are. Uh, at my 60th birthday, uh, the whole family got together and the children started sharing stories about what they remember of me as, you know, as they were growing up as children. And as I was listening to the stories, uh, it, it, you know, it was really weird because I realized that none of my children grew up with the same father. <laughs> because, you know, each one perceived me very differently. So there's one David Aaron, but there's many fathers to these children because who you are depends, determines very much how in your relationship to somebody they appear to you. So this world is a perception. And, uh, when a per and, and it's a limited perception that is being limited by our senses, you know, our you know, we're seeing the reality through our eyes and through our ears and through our mouth and through our touch and through our nose. And so that's almost like looking into a palace through five keyholes. But when you open the door of the palace, then suddenly you realize that what you thought you were looking at was so much, so much more. And so this world is a limited perception. 
when you leave your body, you encounter reality without the filter of your body. And now you, you, you see reality in a more expansive way. Now, depending on how ready you are for that more expansive perception will determine whether you're in heaven or hell. Uh, because hell will be that your expectations of what's greater than this physical world uh, are being completely um, overwhelmed and you got it all wrong. And that will be a tr tremendous, painful experience. Uh, heaven will be a, a, a tremendous uh, affirmation that what I thought life was about, who I thought I was and what I thought anyone was, I was pretty close. My perception actually was quite close to reality as it is, and that'll be an experience of heaven. So heaven and hell are not places that we go, but the truth is this world is not a place that we are in either. It's a field of perception. And therefore, when you leave this narrow perception, when you leave your body, the next perception could either be a devastating realization of how, how, how wrong you were, and that'll be extremely painful, or it'll be an incredibly relieving and affirming perception of how right you were, and that would be called heaven. Now, it's important to know that in our understanding, hell is not a, is not a perception that you stay with. It, there's a kind of a transformation and a transition whereby it's kind of like opening up the door in, from a dark room and dealing with the light that is very painful, but with time, your eyes adjust to the light. And so then in our tradition, a person would not be in the state of hell for more than 12 months. Okay, beautiful. Thank you. I think that'll help answer a lot of people's questions. So it's interesting how everything you say leads to my next question that I was that on my list to ask. And you talked about exiting the body. So my show initially was about exiting the body briefly, people who've had a heart attack, a drowning, things like that. And my show started because a friend who's actually an observant Torah studying Jewish person in California, he was surfing rabbi. And people can look below and click on it or type in Ryan Surf NDE near-death experience. So he left his body. He was dead close to 30 minutes. Unbelievable. But he was he was gone. He was purple, blue. He was gone. And it's a long story to can't get into right now, of course. But he went somewhere and he shares where he was. So he he said exactly what you said. He left his body, but he didn't leave his body. He's 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 not quite there. He's not quite here. It's really incredible and very difficult to put into words. But people call it near-death experience. I was wondering, is that in the Torah? What is the purpose of near-death experience? And why do some people, they're able to come back and share it? Do you think there's a purpose to it? Right. Well, uh, I'm not familiar with um, something in the Torah describing near-death experience. Although from, a, from my understanding of Torah, there's no reason to disbelieve that 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 as a, a real experience that a person leaves their body but doesn't leave their but look the truth is that when you go to sleep you leave your body uh but you don't leave it completely because then you would be dead uh but you leave it and some of you are still in the body but often the dreams that you have are of some of somewhat of a prophetic quality because you're not encountering reality through your body because you're out of your body. And so having an out-of-body experience is not something that would be surprising to our, to our, to, to our teachings. And, um, you know, the, the, I think it's very valuable that people can share those stories because, uh, you know, when people think this is the end, that's pretty disturbing, <laughs> you know, like, is that my my body is the be all and the end all of who I am, and and when it's gone, I'm gone, and there's nothing left to it. The, the truth is, the body that you know is the body that is in your field of perception. Uh, the only body you know is, is the body that you're aware of. Uh, that means that it's very likely that your body is in the field of your awareness rather than, I mean, how much are you sure you're in your body? Maybe your body's in you. You know, it's like a dream. You know, when you're having a dream, 
have you ever kind of said, oh, you know, I don't like this. I hope this is a dream. I, I'm going to try and wake myself up. And then you're kind of in between. You're in the dream, you're out of the dream. And then you realize that all the people and all the places and all the time that had passed was actually in your mind, in your dream. Uh, it was in you. You were not in it. So the truth is, is the, are you in your body or is your body actually in you? Are you even in this room? Because the room that you know is a room that you perceive. That means that the room, as you perceive it, exists within the field of your awareness. And so are you actually in the room? Now, if you take that to the next step and realize that all the time that you perceive and all the space that you perceive exists within your mind, just like uh, uh, Einstein said, the time and space are illusions. I, I, don't, I don't believe they're illusions. I do think they're perceptions. But, they, but where does time and space actually exist? It's in the field of our awareness. So that would mean that we don't die because we don't really, we're not in time or in space, but time and space are actually in us. I love it. So those of you who are noticing, and I, didn't, I, didn't, I forgot to tell the rabbi, I keep myself off camera most of the time because I'm looking, you know, taking notes and observing, and I, I want people to be able to focus on rabbi. So I'm, I'm back on camera. And before I ask the next question, it's about happiness and the hardship of life, because really that's the purpose of my show. Is there another way people can see your videos? Because I think you have a YouTube channel, right? So do you have YouTube? What's yes. it called and what, what other channels? Rabbi David Aaron. Okay, wonderful. So you can go to if YouTube. They, if they, you know, search Rabbi David Aaron, they'll find lots of stuff on me. And many are cartoons as well, right? So if you notice- Yes, I like to produce little cartoons that have meaning. So if you see cartoons, just know you're in the right place. But so this one I want to ask you, Rabbi. Um, again, the reason I had my show is I had anxiety. It was probably called depression. And I felt such empathy for people. And I didn't understand them before. How, how could people feel this way? Life is so good. We have sunshine. We have a good life. But no, a lot of people don't. So people who are listening to you right now, that maybe their body is failing them or their mind or they're struggling with the loss of a loved one, or they're just having a hard time financially, physically, it could be family, neighbors, we all have struggles. So I want to ask you, why does it seem life is, does, again, this is going to be a course, I know, so this will be my last question. Rob. That's in my book, The Secret Life of God, but go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so get the book, and you'll get all your questions answered. But um, my question is, why does it seem like hardship is by design? And, and how can we be happy? Life is so difficult, Rabbi. Right. Well, the, the, I think in, I, I believe I once saw uh, in Victor Frankl, uh, you know, from the book Man's Search for Meaning, say that the greatest, um, the greatest obstacle to happiness is the pursuit of happiness. And so I think when we make happiness our goal, we undermine our goal uh, because our goal should not be happiness. Our goal should be meaningfulness. And happiness is a side effect that actually happens. Maybe that's why it's called happiness, because it happens on its own. But when you're focused on why am I not happy? How can I be happy? What do I need to do to be happy? Uh, really, the goal is to do good. You know, a lot of people think that we've come to this world to have a good time, but we didn't. We came to this world to do a good deed. And a lot of people think that this world is an amusement park and we're here to, you know, get on the rides. But this world is not an amusement park. This world is a gym and we've come to work out and build character. And so and so I, I heard this one stand up comedian say a great line. He said, I wanted to get in shape. So I joined the gym, but they kept asking me to lift up heavy things. So I left, <laughs> you know, like that's why you're in a gym and that's why we're in this world. And so we shouldn't be surprised that we're being asked to lift up heavy things because we're here to build character and, and, and choose heroism to truly be heroes. And we, not, we might not be heroes that anybody will have ever heard of, but everybody will be impacted by because we're also connected to each other. And so, you know, a person should know that hardship is not a sign necessarily that you've done something wrong, but it might be a great vote of confidence of the creator that you're able to do something very right and in that hardship you are going to be a hero and you are going to help others and even if they never meet you and even if they never hear your story because we're all connected to each other it gets deposited in let's call it a collective consciousness bank and when somebody's looking for some strength 
you know, they say the story about Roger Bannister who broke a world record in running. And then, and then right after that, everybody broke that record because he created a new norm. And so a person should understand that whatever they're going through, uh, you know, is, is a vote of confidence, you know, that, you know, I have a friend who has um, two autistic children and she, you know, asked me like, nobody in my community has even one autistic child and what did i do wrong why am i being punished and i said you know let's call her wendy i said wendy let me ask you a question uh imagine this kind of a conversation with the creator imagine god says to you wendy i have these two souls that have agreed to come and play the the part of autistic children and i need a soul that is uh, a, a great soul that has the patience and the kindness and the and the intelligence to raise those two souls would you do me a favor would you be willing to play their mother what would you say to god if he asked you that she said well i'd say for sure i said well you did and that changed her life because she saw it as a opportunity she saw it as a mission she realized that it was a vote of confidence uh, rather than some kind of you know, indication that there's something wrong with her. It was really a demonstration that there's something potentially very right about her. Oh, Rabbi, I'm off camera, so you all can't see. That got me, that got me teary because I just want to thank you for your vote of confidence because life can be so hard. I have so many friends that are really struggling and I have struggled. So I just want to thank you for everything you said. And for those of you who are going to reach out to Rabbi, I'm going to put everything in the description. And I want to say a quote that I that I remembered from your emails. And you said, we're not just human beings, we're human becomings. Yeah. And you just summarize it with what you just said in the last two minutes. So I want to thank you. Is there anything else you want to say, Rabbi, ways to reach out to you or a little bit about your school or anything else before we go? Oh, wow. Well, I actually, what you just mentioned, I did want to share, you know, imagine you're climbing up a mountain. And it's a long journey and it's very hard. And uh, someone, a friend comes by in a helicopter and says, what are you doing? And you say, well, I'm climbing this mountain. And, and your friend says, well, what's your goal? And you say, well, the top of the mountain. And your friend says, well, look at you, you're in pain. How long you've been climbing? Well, it's been two weeks. Uh, how much longer is your climb? It's probably another two weeks. Well, get into my helicopter. I'll take you up there in five minutes. Would you get in the helicopter? Well, you wouldn't, you know why? Because the goal was not the top of the mountain. The goal was every step of the climb. And so it's about the journey. It's about the quality of the journey. And, um, you know, I, I would say that uh, I, I've, I've struggled to figure out if I could sum up what I see my life's mission is being a son of a survivor. Uh, it's really about, I just wanna help people suffer less and feel happier. Uh, I think as a child, it was hard for me to be happy because I felt I was abandoning my mother's sadness. And I felt like if I'm happy, how can I be happy when my mother said that my mother was never depressed, which was really quite a, amazing. I have a friend whose mother lived in a dark room uh, after the Holocaust and can't imagine what that does to you. But my mother was very energetic and very active. But I always felt the sadness in her eyes, you, you know, the scars of being in the concentration camp. And, um, and in many ways, people say, oh, Rabbi Aaron's funny. I think it's because I wanted to get my mother to laugh. And so, you know, I, I, I just want to be of, in service and try and help people suffer less and feel happier in their lives. So my website is rabbidavidaaron.com. And if I can be of any help to anybody, that's really an honor and a privilege and a gift to me. Uh, I, I love this quote from Mark Twain. The best way to cheer yourself up is to cheer somebody up, up, up somebody else up. And I really believe that. So uh, I'm grateful for you inviting me to your show and you do a wonderful interview. Thank you. Ah, thank you. And I feel privileged and blessed that you said yes to this interview. And thank you for for your words of inspiration and helping us because we're all in this together. And I, I thank you, Rabbi Aaron, and thank you to God for having us here today and, and for the life that you brought us. So, and thank you, Rabbi. Thank you very much.